Let's uh, open up with a word of prayer, and then we'll get started. Father, we're grateful for uh, something that we usually just take for granted, um, that we live in a a country (laughs) that gives us freedom to worship as we please. Most people around the world don't have that. So forgive us for our uh, sort of casual attitude about the whole thing. And also forgive us, Lord, for... As a people and as a church, we've really forgotten who exactly made that possible. It was the principles of your word penetrating um, Western civilization. So as we try to bring that to light today in our two sessions, um, I do pray that you would be magnified and glorified for what you have done in American history to give us what we have today. And we know that your word uh, says, you shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. So I do pray, Lord, that you would set us free of cultural lies. You would set us free, as the gospel is presented, of our sin debt, as hopefully many within the sound of my voice will trust in the work of the Messiah today, so to be saved. We're going to pause just for a moment, Lord, and take a few moments of silence just to confess any unconfessed sins we may have committed against you as your people so that fellowship can be restored, not position, but fellowship, and so that we may receive freely today from your spirit. I do pray, Lord, that as your truth goes out today and also that we partake of the Lord's Supper and also fellowship afterwards, um, that your work of the Holy Spirit that you seek to accomplish in your church on this particular day at Sugarland Bible Church may go forth unhindered. And we ask these things in Jesus' name and God's people said, amen. All right, well, good morning, everybody. Happy Independence Day weekend. Um, If you could take your Bibles and turn to the book of Proverbs, chapter 14. And verse 34, and as you're turning there, I want to sort of Uh, memorialize just for a moment and commemorate one of the greats uh, who went to be with the Lord, a man named Dr. Ed Heinsen. You may be familiar with him. I think he passed away yesterday, if I've got my story straight. And uh, I knew him through the pre-trib study group. And he was uh, one of the great stalwarts of prophecy And he was um, the dean of academic affairs or something like that, a a big highfalutin guy, I guess we can put it, at Liberty University. And so anything that you can find uh, written by Dr. Heinsen, I'd I'd recommend it. So um, as we like to say, earth is poorer, but heaven is richer because of his passing. Um, We're going to take a break from our normal routine, um, which is the Middle East Meltdown study in Sunday school and the Genesis study in the main service and bring you a couple of special teachings related to uh, Independence Day. And so I've entitled this Seven Principles That Made America Great. And as I was putting this together, I I said to the Lord, Lord, you're showing me so much information here. How can I share this in 45 minutes? And the Lord said, don't even try. Break it into two sessions. And so what we don't finish in Sunday school, 
uh, we'll try to complete, Lord willing, in the main service that follows. But the truth of the matter is if you are living in the United States of America, you're like sitting on the golden ticket because you're radically blessed. We know that just by looking at the number of people that are trying to get into this country. And when you lift the gates around America, everybody wants to get in. If you lifted the gates around Cuba, everybody want to get out. So obviously there's something very special here and very unique here. One of the most unique things that we have is the longevity of our founding documents. So one historian puts it this way, consider the Declaration of Independence, which is America's birth certificate. No nation has ever been as long under the same founding document as America has under the Declaration. In fact, France had their revolution more than a decade after America did, and she is now in her 15th government. Brazil has had seven constitutions since 1822. Poland has had seven since 1921. Afghanistan has had five since 1923. Russia has had four since 1918. And the story is similar for other nations. This type of instability has characterized nations in Europe, Africa, South America, and the rest of the world except America. And that's really what we mean when we use the expression American exceptionalism. A lot of people get very upset about that, but it has a very simple definition. A lot of people take it as, oh, you're saying you're superior to everybody else, and that's not what American exceptionalism means. What American exceptionalism means is America is the exception to the rule. The rule in most places is totalitarianism and instability. And for our, how long have we been a nation? 246 years, something like that. Um, we've been spared from all of that. So there must be something special about the American system. There's a lot of talk today in the political world about MAGA making America great again, uh, which is a wonderful conversation to have, but every time I hear that, I want to know, well, what made America great in the first place? I mean, if we're going to make it great again, we got to figure out how did it become great. And I think I have the answer. The answer is the Bible. B-I-B-L-E, that's the book for me, Right? And part of being a Bible church, because Bible is our middle name, right? Sugarland Bible Church. Part of being a Bible church is not just understanding the content of the Bible. I mean, we go overboard trying to explain at this church the content of the Bible. But that's only half of the battle to really appreciate God's word. Not only do you need to understand the content of the Bible, but you need to understand the impact of the Bible on civilization. I think it was the late D. James Kennedy who wrote a book called What If the Bible Had Never Been Written? And he traces in that book all of these cultural disasters, all of these cultural blessings that wouldn't exist anymore. And one of the things that would not exist if the Bible had never been written is the United States of America. So let's start here with Proverbs 14, verse 34, which says, lower tax rates exalt a nation. Whoops, doesn't say that. It says righteousness exalts a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. And so much of the conversation about the United States is all of these kind of tangential political discussions about taxes and all these other kinds of things, but your Bible says those aren't even the issue. The issue is righteousness. And then in Psalm 33, verse 12, it says, Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. 
And one of the things you have to understand about God and the promises that he's made in his word is that God has not promised to bless a man. He has not promised to bless a movement. He has not promised to bless a method. But he has promised to bless his word. And everywhere his word is allowed to penetrate, whether it's a church, a human heart, or a whole nation, God says, my blessings won't be far behind. And so what we're going to try to identify is the biblical principles that penetrated American civilization like no other civilization and has allowed us to live in this blessed country. Did the Bible really penetrate American civilization? Yes, it did. Here's a quote from Donald Lutz and his uh, colleague, a man named Heinemann, two credentialed political scientists, set out around 1980 to try to figure out, of all of the primary sources that America's founding fathers quoted, what was their number one source that they quoted? And you can see the stats here. 34% of America's founding fathers were quoting the Bible at the time of America's founding. And then uh, 8% come from Montesquieu, 8% come from Blackstone, 3% come from Locke. But you notice that the Bible is quoted four times more than any other single source. And if I had time to walk through it with you, I could show you that Montesquieu and Blackstone and Locke were steeped in the Bible. And so when America was being debated and started, this is our origin. This is our history. This is what our founding fathers were looking to. They were either looking to the Bible itself or they were looking to men who were influenced dramatically uh, by the Bible. John Quincy Adams, and believe me, I've spent a lot of time making sure that these quotes are original quotes because there's a lot of fake history out there. Some of these quotes, one afternoon I had to traipse all over the Houston library system to track them down. So every quote that I'm going to use in these presentations, to the best of my understanding, is an original citation. John Quincy Adams, America's sixth president, made this statement. He says, the birthday of the nation is indissolubly linked with the birthday of the Savior and forms a leading event in the progress of the gospel dispensation. The Declaration of Independence first organized the social compact on the foundation of the Redeemer's mission upon the earth and laid the foundation for the cornerstone of human government upon the first precepts of Christianity. He made that statement at a uh, oration at a 4th of July celebration all the way back, I believe, in 1837. And what he's saying is if you Christians want to celebrate Jesus, you need to celebrate his birth. And you also need to celebrate America. Because America is the first country that took the precepts of Jesus Christ and brought it into national, national life. And so what were those principles that America relied upon? Um, we're going to identify seven princ such principles. One of the reasons I think the study of America's founding fathers is so significant today is that they function like a plumb line. And you remember what the prophet Amos said about a plumb line. In Amos chapter 7, verses 7 and 8, he says, Thus he showed me, and behold, the Lord was standing by a vertical wall with a plumb line in his hand. The Lord said to me, What do you see, Amos? And I said, A plumb line. Then the Lord said, Behold, I'm about to put a plumb line in the midst of my people Israel, and I will spare them no longer. Now, what exactly is a plumb line? It's a line 
like a rope hanging from a ceiling that's weighted at the bottom. So a plumb line is always going to be straight. It's like looking at a compass. It's not going to deceive you. It's not going to lie to you. It will always be straight. You can always trust it. And what God is saying to the nation of Israel is I'm going to hold up the plumb line to Israel's structure and show you that her structure is crooked. And you won't be able to discern that her structure is crooked unless you compare it to the plumb line. That largely is, I think, how the writings of our founders function. You don't really understand how far off we are today as a nation and how confused we are unless you compare it to what our founding fathers actually presented and said. And so by way of analogy, I'm trying to use their uh, uh, writings as sort of a, a plumb line. Because there isn't really any hope for national repentance. People talk about that a lot. Unless you understand what it is we need to repent of. And unless you understand America's founding, you have no ability to convey these truths to your children and your grandchildren. And by the way, you need to convey these truths to your grandchildren and your grandchildren because I can guarantee you 100% they're not getting these in their public school curriculum. All of this history that I'm going to present has been blotted out. I'm reminded of what the Lord said to the church at Ephesus when he called them to repent. In Revelation chapter 2, verse 5, the Lord said to Ephesus in the book of Revelation, Remember from where you have fallen, and repent and do the deeds you did at first, or else I am coming to you, and I will remove your lampstand out of its place unless you repent. You'll notice that the Lord here didn't just say repent. What he said is first remember. Remember what? Remember where, from which you've fallen. Remember the heights from which you've fallen. Unless you're thinking back to where you used to be, you have no barometer in place by which you can even intelligently repent or change or change your mind. And so you can't have repentance ever without remembrance is what this is saying. You can't have national repentance either it, as long as we have kind of national amnesia and don't remember from the heights from which we, from which we came. So with all of that being said, we're going to try to identify here the seven principles that made America great. Um, you might look at this list and say, well, you forgot this one and that one, and you, you can make your own sermon and call it eight principles or nine principles. Um, these, to me, are the most significant ones. And so let's uh, start moving through this list. And as I said before, what we don't finish in the first hour, Lord willing, we'll try to finish in the second hour. The first principle that made America completely blessed, uh, unique, exceptional, is what I'll call the sanctity of life principle. When you go back to the book of Genesis, you see very clearly the sanctity of life. Genesis chapter 1, verse 27 says, God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him male and female. So on the very first page of God's book, right out of the gate, God says man, humanity is different. Because humanity, unlike all the other facets of God's creation, is special because humanity bears my very image. Uh, Jesus talked about this a lot. Jesus, three times that I could find, says human life is higher than animal life. You know, completely different than the evolutionary dogma from you to the goo, goo to you via the zoo over billions of years. If you believe that, you're just an evolved animal. The Bible, right out of the gate, says we're not like the animals. We're different than the animals. For example, Jesus said, 
In Matthew 6, verse 26, look at the birds of the air. They do not sow, nor reap, nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you, humanity, people, notice male and female, are you not worth much more than they? Oh, you have little faith. So right out of the gate, Jesus reiterates what's in Genesis chapter 1, that human beings are higher than animal life. Mankind is the pinnacle of God's uh, creation. And you might ask yourself, well, did the fall of man, Genesis 3, did that change our status? And the answer is no. Our status is still the same, even in our fallen state. Genesis 9 verse 6, long after the flood. Post-fall, post-flood, says, Whoever sheds man's blood, by man his blood will be shed, for in the image of God is God made man. So that image-bearing status continues. Effaced by the fall, yes. Erased by the fall, no. And in the book of James, New Testament, chapter 3, verse 9, this becomes the basis for the exhortation for us to curb our tongues. Genesis 3 verse 9 says concerning the tongue, With it we bless our Lord and Father, and with it we curse men who have been made in the likeness of God. So human beings continue even in their fallen state with this exalted image-bearing status. So humans have dignity. And with dignity, human beings are entitled to certain legal and political rights. In other words, rights come to us from God by virtue of how we are designed by God. That's what Genesis chapter 1 is teaching. America is the only country that's ever existed in the history of the world, as far as I know, where that principle came out of the Bible and made it right into our founding documents, like the Declaration of Independence. Don't take my word for it. Take the words of Calvin Coolidge, America's 30th president, who at a July the 4th weekend celebration all the way back in 1926, said, quote, the principles which went into the Declaration of Independence are found, and I love this, in the sermons, look at that, of the early colonial clergy. They justified freedom by the text that we are all created in the divine image. So America's founding fathers basically were listening to pastors talk about Genesis chapter 1. And America's founding fathers said, hey, that's, that's really important. Let's take that concept, let's take that principle, and let's put it into America's birth certificate, the Declaration of uh, Independence. So here's what your Declaration of Independence says, America's birth certificate. 1776. You notice how the Declaration of Independence keeps mentioning God over and over again. And probably the most important line of these in the Declaration of Independence is right there in the middle. And it says they, that's us, are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights. And you'll notice that America's founding document, her birth certificate, starts with God. No other nation in the history of the world, as far as I know, has that origin. It starts with God, and it gives us, from God, unalienable rights. Now, in that word, unalienable, you might recognize the word lean. If you have a piece of property, and I own a lien against your property, then your property doesn't belong to you. It belongs to me. 
meaning if you sell the property, I get the proceeds from the sale. So when our founding fathers used this expression, unalienable right, what they meant is you have a right coming to you from God that man cannot take away. And the reason man cannot take it away and man has no lien against it is because it didn't come from man. Now, if it came from man, what man giveth, man can take away. But if it comes from God, then man cannot take it away. And so the United States government is unique in this sense. It does not create rights. If you think the United States government exists to create rights, then you've missed the whole point of America's foundation. The United States government does not create rights. The United States government, by design, recognizes pre-existing rights given from God and then functions in such a way so that those rights can be protected. So in the Declaration of Independence, after it mentions unalienable rights, you find this clause in it. It says that to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed. In other words, government exists to protect rights that are unalienable, given from God. John Adams, America's second president, said, quote, rights are antecedent to all earthly governments. Rights cannot be repealed or restrained by human laws. Rights are derived from the great legislature of the universe. And so right now, we're meeting in this church under the protection of the First Amendment, which says, Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment or of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. We're meeting here because of that amendment and that amendment exists because America's founders recognize that that right comes from God. If God gave it, man can't take it away. If God gave it, COVID, emergency powers, can't suspend it. You see that? If God gave it, then a shooting in Uvalde, Texas, doesn't give the government the right to say, okay, we're going to um, confiscate all of your weapons. The government has no right to do that because they're tampering with a right that comes only from God. And just to show you how far we've fallen from this concept, you'll notice here the words of former Attorney General Janet Reno, probably one of your personal favorites, I'm sure. And this is what she said in the wake of the Branch Davidian Waco massacre. She said, quote, you are part of a government that has given its people more freedom than any other government in the history of the world, close quote. She was actually quoted in the Wall Street Journal saying that. That statement is completely and totally false. Because she's saying here that government gives us rights. No, no, Janet, government doesn't give us rights. Government exists to protect previously recognized rights that come from God. And I find this very interesting because at the time she was the highest uh, law enforcement official in the country. And yet here the highest law official, enforcement official in the country, the Attorney General, does not even understand what America is based on. Or else she wouldn't be making statements like that. The United Nations Declaration, even though it has scripture on their wall, the United Nations in New York, has all of this kind of syrupy language about you know, freedom of speech and all of these kinds of things. But in the United Nations Declaration, you will notice that God is never mentioned. The United Nations sets itself up as the guarantor of rights. That is not the formula in the United States. That's why if the United States, God forbid, were ever to put itself 
under the United Nations, which could happen, then the United States would be putting itself under a form of government that is foreign to the United States of America's Declaration of Independence. Because in America, our rights come from God, and what God giveth, man cannot taketh. And the government exists to protect rights already in existence, and this is what we call unalienable rights. This, by the way, is why there is an attack today on Thomas Jefferson. Thomas Jefferson is the man is basically recognized as the principal author of the Declaration of Independence. Without Thomas Jefferson, you don't even have the concept of unalienable rights clearly expressed. And here is uh, Mayor de Blasio in the city of New York moving the statue of Thomas Jefferson out of the city council chambers, even though that statue has been in that building, I've been told, for 180 years. I mean, why is all of a sudden now Thomas Jefferson a problem? And if Thomas Jefferson is now some big problem, then all of a sudden the whole concept of unalienable rights, which Thomas Jefferson, better than anybody else articulated, those begin to disappear as well. Well, the justification is, well, Thomas Jefferson owned slaves. And so obviously he was a racist. Um, this is what you call critical race theory. And I know what a lot of you are thinking as I'm talking about unalienable rights. You're, talking, you're thinking, well, what about the, those that were slaves in this country? Let, let me let you in on a little secret here. America did not invent slavery. Slavery is a disease that, in, in, that infected the whole human race, very sadly. Every nation has been infected at some way or some form with the horrible institution called slavery. America is no exception to that rule. But what is unique about the United States of America is the United States of America actually did something to fix the problem. It's called the Civil War. Following the Civil War came the Civil Rights Movement of 1964. And the reason America had the, even the moral capacity to right a wrong is because Americans understood the Declaration of Independence that all of our rights come from God. Therefore, it's wrong for one group to enslave another group. A book that would tremendously help people on this is a book by Thomas West, I think of the Claremont Institute. I read this a few years, years ago. It's called Vindicating the Founders. And in that particular book, he acknowledges, yeah, uh, many of our founding fathers were in favor of slavery, but not all of them. There was an extremely strong abolition movement in existence in the writings of our founding fathers going back to the founding era. And the problem is if the abolition movement had insisted that our Constitution abolish slavery, then we wouldn't have a Constitution because the South would have never cooperated with that. And so our founding fathers actually made a choice. They said, okay, we're going to kick the can down the road and let a subsequent generation deal with this issue. And history has proven them right. Subsequent generations, Civil War, post-Civil War amendments, 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments, and the Civil Rights Act of 1964 corrected a blight in the American system from its foundation. And so this is the part of the equation that never comes out today from the progressive left 
or from critical race theoreticians, all they want to say is Thomas Jefferson owned slaves. Therefore, tear everything down. Well, the issue is a little bit more complicated than that. And at some point, people need to be intellectually honest about it. And I recommend this book here by Thomas West entitled Vindicating the Founders. But one thing is for sure, one of the things that makes America completely unique, completely different, makes it stand out, is the sanctity of life principle that rights come from God. In fact, as I said before, had that principle not existed, there would be no intellectual framework to get rid of segregation the institutions of slavery, etc. They looked at it as kind of a note of indebtedness to America's Declaration of Independence. So that's principle number one. And boy, it's a good thing I broke this up into a couple of sessions, amen? Principle number two that made America great is the recognition of human depravity. Genesis chapter 8, verse 21 says, For the intent of man's heart is evil from his youth. If the Bible teaches anything, it teaches the universal reality of sin. Because if sin were not a universal reality, we would not need what? A Savior. You have to understand the power of sin and its universal nature in order to have the incentive to reach out to Jesus Christ as your Savior. So the Bible is very clear on what we call the depravity of man. A classic passage on it is Jeremiah 17, verse 9, which says, The heart is more deceitful than all else and is desperately sick and who can understand it. So we're corrupted through Adam's fall right into our inner being, and this is why we need Jesus Christ. Amen? Romans chapter 3, verse 23 says, For some have sinned. Nope, doesn't say that. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, the universal nature of sin. Now, when America's founding fathers put together our system, they said, this is a problem. Because the universal reality of sin affects the governed, people under the government, the citizenry, and it also affects the people running the government. Because the people running the government, even the ones that graduated from Harvard, have the exact same sin nature as everybody else. So our founding fathers rejected something that was prominent in Europe from which they fled called the divine right of kings. That there are certain people that have sort of an uncorrupted nature and they're born to rule and they're wiser than the rest of us. Our founding fathers in the United States expressly rejected that because of passages like Romans chapter 3, verse 23. So when they put together our government, they had a big problem. The problem was sin. So A, we have to make the government strong enough to deter the sinful impulses of the masses governed by the government, And simultaneously, at the same time, we have to make it weak enough so it won't go to the heads, so to speak, of the people running the government, since the people running the government have the exact same sin nature as everyone else. Our founding fathers understood something called tyranny. Tyranny is the default mode of most governments around the world and most governments in human history. Most governments in human history make the mistake of making the government too strong. It's positive in the sense that it curtails the sinful impulses of the citizenry, but it leads to runaway tyranny if there's no simultaneous uh, encumbrance attached to the government which would curb the sinful impulses of those doing the governing. 
So Lord Acton put it very well. He said, all power tends to corrupt, and absolute power corrupts what? Absolutely. So you see at the Constitutional Convention this balancing act that they're trying to come up with. You see James Madison in Federalist Paper number 51 explaining this. Um, what are the Federalist Papers? The Federalist Papers were basically a series of articles published in the New York newspapers trying to convince the farmers, which is funny to me because today everybody thinks the Federalist Papers are so scholarly. The Federalist Papers were probably written about to an eighth grade level in this time period, which today is really a PhD level. And they were trying to talk these farmers into, go ahead, accept the Constitution. And so they were different papers designed to shed light on this Constitution that they were talking about. And in Federalist Paper number 51, these are co-authored by Alexander Hamilton, James Madison, and John Jay. I believe that Madison wrote this particular piece in number 51, and he explains what makes America different. He says, quote, but what is government but the greatest reflections on human nature? I mean, isn't that what I've spent a couple minutes talking about? If men were angels, no government would be necessary. If angels were to govern men, then neither external nor internal controls on government would be necessary. In framing a government which is to be administered by men over men, see that there? By men over men, the great difficulty lies in this. You must first enable the government to control the governed, and in the next place, oblige it to control itself. This is, a, this is a delicate balancing act, and if we get this one wrong, we're going to go into the default mode of tyranny. We can't make the government too weak, or it can't control the sinful population. We can't make the government too strong because if the government is too strong, it will lead to runaway tyranny because the people running the government have the exact same sin nature as the people under the government since we believe Romans 3 verse 23 and have rejected the divine right of kings. So this is the balancing act that they're trying to strike here. So what do they do? It's, it's, it's absolutely genius what they did. They divided power. They didn't say the government's going to have no power. Uh, the libertarian mindset says that. But that's not what the founding fathers believed. We're going to have a government, and it's going to have power. But we're going to design it to be weak enough so that it doesn't have maximum power. Because if it has maximum power, it will lead to tyranny. And so they took federal power, national power, and they divided it up horizontally amongst the three branches of government. Legislative branch makes the law. Executive branch enforces the law. Judicial branch interprets the law. Hey, I've read that somewhere before. There it is, Isaiah 33, verse 22, which says, For the Lord is our judge, that's judicial power, the Lord is our lawgiver, that's legislative power. The Lord is our king, that's executive power. Those are the only three ways that political power can manifest itself. And I don't mind if the one person that controls all three is God. Because God don't make no mistakes, amen? But it's a problem when you centralize it in people with a sin nature. So our founding fathers deliberately said we will not do that, we will divide it up horizontally. James Madison in Federalist Paper number 47 says, if you merge any of these two together, it will lead to tyranny. He said, quote, the accumulation of all powers, legislative, executive, and judiciary in the same hands 
whether of one or a few, or many, and whether hereditary or self-appointed or elective may justly be pronounced the very definition of tyranny. The moment two or three branches of power are merged together is the moment James Madison said, you'll be just like any other country in world history, you will become tyrannical. And you need to pay attention to this very carefully because during COVID, governors, many of them, were acting like lawgivers. No, the governor is not supposed to make laws concerning COVID from scratch. That is the job of the legislature. The governor only exists to enforce a law that's already on the books. Now, they justified it as, well, these are executive orders. You need to watch executive orders very, very carefully because when the executive branch starts issuing executive orders, kind of like we've seen at the state and federal level in the last couple of years, like crazy, they are merging together two branches of government, executive and legislative, and James Madison says, when that starts, you're moving in the direction of a tyrannical government. So not only did our founding fathers divide political power horizontally, but they said, you know what, that's not enough. We're going to divide it vertically. And we're going to create two layers of government operating over the same geographic expanse. We're going to have our national government, and then we're going to have the individual state governments. You see this expressed in the Tenth Amendment to the United States Constitution, which says the power is not delegated to the United States by the Constitution nor prohibited by it to the states are reserved to the states or respectively to the people. The power was primarily to rest, not with the feds that have become what I like to call Fedzilla, but the, the layer of government closest to the people, the state government. And that's a good thing to put that layer of government closest to the people because if the people don't like what the states are doing, the people have a say. It's called the ballot box. That is a division of power, not just horizontally, but vertically. You see this expressed in the Federalist Papers. Um, this one, I think, also written by Madison in Federalist Paper number 45. He says, the power is delegated by the proposed Constitution. To the federal government are few and defined. Those which are to remain in the state governments are numerous and indefinite. And then our founding fathers said, wait, we need to put some more handcuffs on government so that it doesn't move into runaway tyranny. One more thing we're going to add here is unalienable rights, which we've talked about earlier. These are things that the government can't trample upon because they're given by God. So our founding fathers put three sets of handcuffs on our government. Number one, they divided power horizontally. Number two, they divided power vertically. And number three, they said, here are areas you can't touch because these rights come from God and man can't step on them or take them away. This is a tremendous balancing act. And I'm here to tell you that it would be impossible without a biblical worldview. Because only the biblical worldview teaches the reality of the universal impact of sin. Now, as you probably know, I'm not exactly the poster boy for Calvinism. I think a lot of the things that modern day Calvinism is, is preaching today, I call it neo-Calvinism, is an overreach. But that doesn't change the historical fact that our founding fathers fleeing from Europe came from a Calvinistic understanding. Calvinism, as you probably know, is known through the mnemonic device TULIP, 
and the very first thing they put on the list is total depravity. I mean, if Calvinists understand anything, they understand that, that man is totally depraved. And this was the post-Reformation theology in Europe that our founding fathers came from when they started this uh, republic. So Lorraine Bettner, in his uh, pro-Calvinistic book, The Reformed Doctrine of Predestination, a book that I disagree with on many things, has a wonderful section in it where he talks about the historical influence of Calvinism on the founding of America. And he makes statements like this. He's quoting a historian here named Bancroft. Bettner says, Bancroft, quoting Bancroft, simply calls Calvin the father of America and adds, he who will not honor the memory and respect the influence of Calvin knows nothing but the, but knows but little of the origin of American liberty. My point is simply this. If America's founding fathers had come from the field of psychology, or they had been secular humanists, and they thought that people are inherently good, they would have never come up with this balancing act that we see in Federalist Paper Number 51. They would have never said, hey, we've got an issue here of sin. We've got to make the government strong enough to curb the sinful impulses of the citizenry and simultaneously weak enough to have three separate sets of handcuffs on it. That whole balancing act comes from a mind that understands what the Bible says concerning uh, total depravity. And so had our system not come in, into existence when this was biblically acknowledged throughout the culture, we wouldn't have the government that we have today. That's why it's sort of humorous when you listen to these uh, commentators, political commentators complaining, hey, there's nothing getting done in Washington, D.C., and I'm thinking to myself, well, thank God for that. That's by design. Our government is intentionally designed so people would not do things fast. By the way, if you want things done fast, if you want to live in a country where things happen lickety split, I would recommend Iran. That would be a nice place to live. Or Saudi Arabia. Because those governments come out of a completely different worldview than the American system. That's why you run into people like the late Ruth Bader Ginsburg, um, who was on the Supreme Court, as you know, for many, many years. And in this particular interview, it says, on February 2012, U.S. Supreme Court Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg appeared on Egypt's TV following the overthrow of Hosni Mubarak, and she is sort of being asked, okay, now that this overthrow in Egypt has happened, what kind of constitution would you recommend for Egypt? And she intentionally says here in this interview, I would not look to the United States Constitution if I were drafting a constitution in the year 2012. She mentions all of these other constitutions that Egypt should imitate. And she says she promotes them because they are much more recent than the United States Constitution. Now this is, uh, at the time, a sitting Supreme Court justice saying this to Egypt as they're thinking about how to form a new government in light of this overthrow. And basically what she is saying is, don't follow the United States Constitution because it's so old. You need something new. And I'm here trying to explain to you why the United States Constitution never gets old. The reason it never gets old is it is a set of handcuffs on human nature. That's what Madison said in Federalist Paper number 51. What is government? 
but the greatest of all reflections of human nature. It is a set of handcuffs on human nature, and human nature does not change. Uh, that's the refutation to the idea that the United States Constitution is so old, we need to get rid of it. There's a third principle that made America great. I would call this the anti-New World Order principle. As you probably know from our studies in the book of Genesis, that God is anti-New World Order. You see that at the Tower of Babel. What is the New World Order? It's a one-world system of economics, politics, and religion that excludes God. This is what was attempted at the Tower of Babel, and it's what God rejected by confounding the language, preventing the builders from cooperating with each other. So this becomes the birth of the nation state. If we were to take a time to look up all of these verses, you would see very clearly that God's ambition or desire for the human race post-fall is individual nation states are to have the power but not world government. This is why Deuteronomy 32 verse 8 says he set the boundaries of the peoples. That's the nation state. Paul on Mars Hill says, Acts 17, 26, he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on the face of the earth, having determined their appointed times and the boundaries, doesn't that sound like borders there? The boundaries of their habitation. So this becomes one of the five divine institutions. You say, what are the divine institutions? These are institutions that God himself in early Genesis has built into the fabric of fallen creation so that fallen creation can be sustained in spite of its fallenness. One of them is the institution of divine conscience. The second is marriage and family. The third is the institution of divine labor. The fourth one is government itself. And the fifth one, which is what I'm talking about right here, is nationalism. God wants humanity divided according to nations, not nations acquiescing their authority to the new world order, some sort of supranational, transnational government. And so what you have to understand is that when America was started, it was started anti-new world order. Uh, one of our early Puritan leaders who came to this country aboard the ship, our, our Bella is named John Winthrop. He lived from 1587 to 1649, and he is the first to call America, which was yet to come into existence, a city set upon a hill. He said, for we must consider that we shall be as a city set upon a hill. The eyes of all people are upon us, so that if we shall deal falsely with our God in this work we have undertaken and so cause him to withdraw his present help from us, we shall be a story and a byword throughout the world. Uh, Ronald Reagan used this language in his farewell speech. Uh, I believe that John F. Kennedy used this language. America is a city set upon a hill. It's not going to be like all the other countries. It's going to be special. It's going to be exceptional. It's going to be unique, and it's actually going to function as a lighthouse to the rest of the world, showing the rest of the world what is possible under the principles of God's word. Now, city set upon a hill. I've read that somewhere before. Where have I read that? Oh, there it is. Jesus used the same expression in the Sermon on the Mount. He said, you are the light of the world, a city set on a hill. That's where John Winthrop got the language from. And John Winthrop said this. He said, 
It shall be a service to the church of great consequence to carry the gospel into those parts of the world. That's the new nation that was just getting its legs at this time. To help on the coming of the fullness of the Gentiles. In other words, America exists to spread the gospel. And then look at this next phrase. And to raise a bulwark against the kingdom of the Antichrist, which the Jesuits labor to rear up in those parts. America, from its beginning, was anti-Antichrist. Who wants to bring in the new world order? Now, as you know, you have all of these globalist groups, whether it's the Davos group, the Great Global Reset, countless others meeting, trying to force America into the new world order. And you know what the number one subject on their minds is? How do we get the Americans to cooperate with this? I mean, how can we bring America the land of the free, the home of the brave, into the new world order. America, from its roots, according to John Winthrop itself, is designed to be an impediment to the new world order. This is why George Washington, in his farewell address, by the way, you know George Washington could have become a king here. He was so popular. And because he was a man of character, he says, I don't want to be King George. We just escaped one of those. And he stepped out of political power. And he gave a farewell address in 1790. And in that farewell address, he says, America is anti-New World Order. He said, it is our quote, it is our true policy to steer clear of permanent alliances with any portion of the foreign world, close quote. We don't want to come under the auspices of this new world order. By the way, that's why Article 2, Section 2, exists in the United States Constitution. It says this, He, the president, shall have power by and with the advice of, of the Senate to make treaties with other parts of the foreign world, provided that two-thirds of the senators present concur. The president can't just go out and put America into this treaty and that treaty and put us under the auspices of the new world order. And very sadly, that's what's happening. Biden put us right back into the climate Paris Accord without this two-thirds supermajority requirement being satisfied. He also put us back into the Iran deal without this two-thirds Senate supermajority requirement being satisfied. And I'm here to tell you folks that this whole idea of America being anti-New World Order is being aggressively challenged today. America is being pulled right back into the very New World Order that John Winthrop said we existed to resist. Here is a quote from a psychiatrist, Chester Pierce, speaking at a public educational forum in 1973. And he said, every child in America entering school at the age of five is mentally ill because he comes to school with certain allegiances to our founding fathers, toward our elected officials, towards his parents, towards belief in a supernatural being, and towards sovereignty of this nation as a separate entity. It's up to you teachers to make these sick children well by creating the international child of the future. There's a problem with these kids at the age of five. They love mom and dad, they love Jesus, and they love George Washington. It's up to you teachers to fix these kids and make them more pro-New World Order friendly. This, by the way, is an exchange that just happened. I think this is about a day old. Uh, you can watch this on YouTube. It's, I had to use a 
a graphic because it comes from CNN, and I don't watch CNN. But CNN, the reporter says to a Biden advisor, Brian Deese, what do you say to those families that say they can, that say, listen, we can't afford to pay $4.85 per gallon for months, if not years? Hey, we're getting really tired of these high gas prices. What do you people in the Biden administration say about that? And this particular Biden surrogate said, this is a direct quote, this is about the future of the liberal world order. And we have to stand firm, close quote. In other words, we don't, we don't care about your gas prices. What we care is dragging America into this new world order that we ourselves have envisioned. That is contrary to everything that America was founded on. Very quickly, if America is going to be a nation, what does it need? You need what every nation has, a common language, a common culture, a common currency, and enforceable borders. You take one of those things away, you don't have a country anymore, do you? One of the things on this list is enforceable national borders. If you can't enforce your own border, you're not a country. You're a product or a surrogate of the new world order. If you are the head of your home and suddenly anybody can enter your household unvented, unvetted, you don't know who they are, you don't know where they came from, you don't know what their intentions are, then guess what? You're not the head of your home anymore. It's the same principle related to nations. If you can't enforce your borders, you're not a country. And there is an aggressive attempt to get us to not be a country anymore. So we've become part of the new world order. This is what Hillary Clinton said in a speech to a Brazilian bank in 2013. No one even knew she said this until WikiLeaks exposed it. She says, my dream is a hemispheric common market with open trade and open borders. And what she's talking there is new world order talk. And America needs to be brought into this. As you probably know, this is from Breitbart. Joe Biden plans bringing 10 times as many refugees to the U.S. next year. There's all of the... Um, unused border wall materials, $100 million worth just lying dormant because the current administration doesn't want to build the wall that Donald Trump started around America. What is happening is America is being yanked into this new world order and it's losing its distinctiveness as, an, as a nation state and your average person looks at this and just yawns. Oh, well. You know why they're yawning? Because they've never read what John Winthrop said. That America exists to oppose the New World Order. They've never read what George Washington said in his farewell address. That it is our policy to steer clear of foreign entanglements with, with the with the rest of the world. They're not reading Article 2, Section 2 of the United States Constitution, which says the president can't enter into a treaty with a foreign country unless there's a two-thirds supermajority in the Senate requirement met. And because we don't understand the plumb line, as I said at the beginning, which doesn't lie, which is always straight, uh, it's always vertical because we don't, we don't take any time to study the plumb line. We don't see where our structure is getting off base. And yet this anti-New World Order principle is one of the things that has made America great. What has made America great? The sanctity of life principle, number one. Number two, the recognition of human depravity principle, number two. And number three, the non-New world, non World Order principle. 
So buckle your seatbelts because we're just getting started here. In the next session, we've got four more to cover. Let's pray. Father, we're grateful for the United States and what you've done here on, as we commemorate it this, uh, on this special day. Help us to understand that this is a biblical holiday. Just as significant as is Christmas or Resurrection Sunday, because it's the story of how your principles penetrated public life. Make us good stewards of these principles as we seek to te teach them to our children and our grandchildren in the midst of a perverse generation. We'll be careful to give you all the praise and the glory. We ask these things in Jesus' name and God's people said, amen. Happy short intermission. <laughs>